Well, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I appreciate it. And the chance to talk about Nord. Um, in starting out, I could just say that while Nord represents those with rare diseases or rare disorders, um, we use the tagline, alone we are rare, together we are strong, in part because while the disease itself is rare, in totality, 30 million Americans have rare diseases, have a rare disease of some type. So that's approximately 10% of the population that has a rare disease. So in totality, it's not rare, but the individual condition itself is very rare. So NORD, our mission is to improve the health and well-being of people with rare diseases. Um, we have uh, several pillars that I'll speak about momentarily, but as you can imagine, research in terms of new um, rare disease product development is right at the forefront. Public policy is right at the forefront in terms of uh, ensuring access to these therapies. Um, uh, patient assistance is right at the forefront, but I'll speak about these um, momentarily. Um, our core values, as you can see, compassion, inclusion, integrity, collaboration, and innovation. Um, many organizations have core values. Um, as we know throughout our career, some organizations live by those values. Others have those values on a, uh, on a poster in the office, and, and that's about it. Um, but I can say at Nord in my short time here, uh, the commitment to these values. Um, we are representing a population that um, needs help, quite frankly, a population that um, is uh, underdiagnosed, a population that when diagnosed um, has to navigate all of the barriers and hurdles to obtain therapies. Um, when diagnosed also has to deal in many cases with a condition which there is not a therapy to treat. So having that level of compassion, having that level of collaboration to ensure uh, the effort toward common goals, having that value of innovation to pursue new opportunities and new methods to allow people to obtain such therapies for their rare disorders. Um, it really is the core of what we do at Nord. Uh, and so we live and breathe these values. So why was Nord formed? Um, uh, before 1983, with the passage of the Orphan Drug Act, um, there were less than 40 uh, FDA-approved treatments for rare diseases. Um, quite frankly, and, and very understandably, um, companies were not pursuing rare disease product development. Um, the cost was intensive. The return on the investment was minimal. Um, so a rare disease is defined as that of having 200,000 Americans or less diagnosed. Um, so if you're a, a pharmaceutical company and you're investing tens of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of product development, um, a company should rightly see a return on that investment. That was not happening with, with rare disease. So as a result, you had very, very few companies pursuing rare disease product development. However, with the passage of the Orphan Drug Act, um, not only did it establish what a rare disease is, of being 200,000 Americans or less, but it also established several critical incentives to entice companies to enter into rare disease product development. Most notably of them, as you can see on the slide, uh, seven years of marketing exclusivity for an orphan indication. So if a company is the first to market with a product for an orphan indication, and that product has an orphan designation, then that, that company and that therapy will have seven years of market exclusivity. So that company does not have to uh, worry about com competition. Um, uh, and that seven years is meant to be an incentive to allow the company having really sole access to the market uh, to hopefully recoup on those uh, investments that were made in terms of R&D, uh, clinical development, and all the other costs associated with bringing a therapy to market. In addition, a company was granted a 50% tax credit on all costs related to orphan drug clinical testing uh, and product development. 
that was subsequently reduced to 25%, unfortunately, but still a company can recoup as of now one quarter of the orphan, of the related cost for the orphan product being developed. Um, so that still serves as an incentive to recoup some of that investment that a company has made. Um, in addition, federal grants are offered uh, with regard to orphan product development that not only companies, but research institutions can apply for. Uh, again, one more incentive to hopefully entice uh, entities to uh, pursue uh, research in the area of, of orphan disease and orphan product development. And then also, lastly, uh, the waiving of PDUFA, PDUFA fees, PDUFA being the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. Um, so each therapy and each company that pursues a therapy has to pay a fee to the FDA, uh, and that fee allows the FDA to, um, to pay the researchers, to pay the uh, individuals that are reviewing the license application. So in essence, your PDUFA fees are uh, used specifically for your licensure application. Um, but for rare disease, uh, these fees are waived. So a rare disease company or a company pursuing a rare disease does not have to pay um, the roughly three and a half to $4 million uh, for a, uh, a PDUFA licensing application. So one more incentive that hopefully, uh, when combined, uh, entices companies to uh, pursue clinical product development in rare disease. Um, since the passage of the Orphan Drug Act, um, which has been a monumental success, and it's illustrated by the fact that nearly 7,000 orphan drug designations have been granted by the FDA. Uh, as I'm sure many of you know, an orphan drug designation is separate from an indication. Uh, a designation uh, is recognition by the FDA that the company is pursuing a rare disease um, uh, indication at some point in the future. The indication is granted upon licensure of the product. Um, in addition, uh, nearly 900 drugs have been approved by the FDA to treat approximately uh, 1,225 or so orphan indications. So a, a real groundswell of rare disease therapies being approved by the FDA since the passage of the Orphan Drug Act. And as I said earlier, one in 10 Americans are living with a rare disease. Um, approximately 10,000 rare diseases uh, are known um, at present. Uh, but unfortunately, approximately 95% of those are still lacking an FDA-approved therapy. But just on the right, you may have noticed uh, a couple of pictures. The one on the upper right um, has Nord's first president, Abby Meyer, sitting in the middle. Um, this is her testifying um, in the early 1980s um, uh, on behalf of the Orphan Drug Act. Um, behind her, you'll see standing in the middle uh, of the uh, of the row uh, is Henry Waxman, who was the House sponsor of the Orphan Drug Act. Uh, and uh, to his right, to our left, standing in the upper left, is Senator Orrin Hatch, who was the Senate sponsor of the Orphan Drug Act. Then in the lower right, you see uh, the actor Jack Klugman. Uh, this is one of his publicity shots from the TV show Quincy. Uh, you may know Jack Klugman from The Odd Couple, the uh, uh, early to mid 1970s sitcom. But in the early 1980s, he was the star of the television show Quincy M.E. or Quincy Medical Examiner. And that show did two separate episodes specifically for and, and calling for the passage of the Orphan Drug Act. Uh, and uh, Mr. Klugman testified before Congress in support of the Orphan Drug Act and really was an early champion for rare disease product development. Uh, and uh, as a result, we continue to honor him uh, at the organization for uh, his dedication uh, uh, to the Orphan Drug Act. Um, with the passage of the Orphan Drug Act, there was also a need to have an organization that could work with patient groups representing individual rare diseases. So upon the passage of the Orphan Drug Act in 1983, shortly thereafter, NORD was formed and NORD is an umbrella group of rare disease patient advocacy organizations. 
So we have some 360 member organizations of NORD. Uh, and our role is to do a lot of the functions that they cannot at the present time. And that really leads into our pillars. Uh, so NORD has five pillars upon which we are founded. Uh, the first being policy and advocacy. And I'll just call up all these bubbles. Um, policy and advocacy. So NORD is engaged on both federal and state public policy. Um, we are engaged in regulatory affairs activities, most notably with the FDA. Um, we have a rare action network of grassroots advocates uh, present throughout the 50 states. Uh, and we do uh, advocate training workshops as well. Um, many of our member organizations are run on a volunteer basis, so they don't have the capabilities or the staffing uh, to do policy and advocacy. So NORD picks up that uh, effort on their behalf. Um, I'll speak in a little bit about some of the, uh, the policy successes we have had um, uh, over the last several years, but policy is one of the pillars that we are um, very active on. Research is another one. Uh, NORD uh, provides research grants for translational and clinical studies. Um, we will do this with uh, researchers specifically at institutions throughout the country. Uh, NORD has a patient registry platform and a natural history study development program. Uh, it is entitled I Am Rare. This is a, a, a branded uh, a platform that NORD has created uh, to, uh, to perform uh, such natural history studies and to, uh, to create uh, these patient registries. And we do these on behalf of uh, patient advocacy organizations that are looking to develop such registries. We also do uh, original research and, and, and publications. Uh, and then most notably, which I'll speak about a little bit later as well, is that we have a Centers of Excellence network of 40 uh, leading uh, uh, research and teaching institutions throughout the country, including a couple here in Pennsylvania, which I'll speak about uh, in a bit. Uh, NORD also has a patient services wing uh, where we offer uh, premium copay and coinsurance support. Um, as many of you know, um, rare disease therapies are quite expensive. Uh, so we've set up a program to work with patients uh, to provide such services, uh, both on the premium and copay and coinsurance uh, side. Uh, we also provide diagnostic and genetic testing. Um, we provide several different types of ancillary services to patients as well. Um, uh, some of these include um, providing uh, uh, and covering the cost for travel to and from a, um, a, gene, te a gene therapy testing site, for example, uh, to and from physician offices, um, potentially overnight stays where necessary. Um, you know, as you can imagine, access to leading clinicians in rare disease uh, is not easy. There's space throughout the country. In many cases, travel is required. We have uh, patient assistance services to help in that regard. Uh, we also provide emergency relief programs uh, where appropriate for certain diseases as well. Uh, NORD has a, a very active education program, both on the patient and family side. Uh, we also provide medical uh, professional education. Um, as well. Uh, we conduct an annual summit, which we call the annual rare disease and orphan products breakthrough summit. It is the leading rare disease uh, session or the rare disease summit in the United States, over 1,000 individuals we're expecting this year with a focus on the U.S., I should say. Um, the World Orphan Drug Congress typically has more people, but that has an international flavor to it, an international scope to it. Um, at that at that summit, uh, we'll have not only patients and patient organizations, not only uh, um, pharmaceutical companies in the rare disease space, but we have government officials. We'll have nearly 100 government officials um, involved in, in presentations and seminars and on panels, uh, but we'll also have leading researchers uh, in the nation as well. Uh, and then lastly, <clears throat> membership. 
as you indicated, we see here 330 members. Actually, that number is up to about 360 now. Uh, and NOR was founded on the principles of collaboration with a united voice. As I mentioned, the majority of our of our members are patient advocacy organizations on a volunteer basis, so uh, no paid staff uh, on board, uh, and um, they need help, and the services we provide help in that regard. So some of the first that we've achieved over 40 years, uh, we've just ended our 40th anniversary, we've just entered our 40th our 41st year of service. Uh, the Orphan Drug Act in 1983 uh, and subsequent follow-on legislation for the Orphan Drug Act, really the centerpiece of what we do. Uh, then in 1987, NORD was the first organization to create uh, patient assistance programs uh, for rare disease specifically. Uh, and to this day, we have uh, patient assistance programs in place. Um, in the late 2000s, early 2010s, uh, the development of the uh, the FDA Office of Orphan Product Development, uh, which was created in statute, uh, and then as a part of that, clinicaltrials.gov, and a specific section for rare disease directly. Uh, in 2014, the I Am Rare custom registry platform uh, that I spoke about a little bit earlier. And then in 2021, the creation of the Rare Disease Centers of Excellence. So again, some 40, um, approximately, well, actually there are 40 um, rare disease centers uh, throughout the country. And I'll, I'll speak to those uh, in a bit as well. So our patient services program, this Motley crew here runs the program um, on the right. Um, this is the single biggest component of NORD. Uh, we partner with uh, companies um, that are kind enough to contribute uh, to support programs and specific uh, diseases. Uh, we do not run specific uh, product-related programs, but disease-specific programs. So, um, you know, unlike some other for-profit services or in-house services that a company may conduct. These are not product-specific patient assistance programs, but disease-specific. So our hope is that multiple companies contribute to uh, the patient assistance program for a specific disease. We will work with individual companies in terms of uh, some of the other areas of support, including but not limited to uh, travel expenses, travel costs, other costs associated with uh, uh, visiting a... Uh, uh, a center of excellence or some other um, research site. Um, you can see here just some of the, the services that are provided, uh, trial support, some of the expanded access initiatives, premium and copay assistance. That's really at the forefront of what we do, uh, ensuring that patients um, are not penalized with the inability to pay out of pocket uh, for their uh, copay assistance programs or premium assistance programs. Um, the travel and lodging I've spoken about, and then just some of the other non-medical emergency assistance that I've spoken about. Just highlighting some of the distance, uh, some of the differences between our in-house or between company in-house uh, manufacturing patient assistance programs versus uh, some of the programs that we run at Nord. Um, uh, since uh, companies are limited in what they can offer. Uh, NORD does have um, more expanded access. Most notably, um, we can offer assistance in the uh, the public payer uh, sphere, where um, companies cannot companies are hamstrung uh, in many ways by the uh, False Claims Act, uh, where um, with the government payers they do not have the ability to provide such in-house services. NORD does. Um, and so you can just see some of the services that we provide. We can also provide some of the travel expenses and the services related to travel expenses that, that uh, in-house company run programs cannot. So these are some of the, uh, the benefits of a NORD program uh, in particular. Um, I won't go through all of these. I think I've, I've made the point about uh, some of the NORD programs uh, and, and the assistance that we can offer above and beyond what an in-house uh, company program can do. 
Um, another area in our education uh, section specifically, but one of uh, great interest is our rare disease database. NORD receives over 2 million hits a month on our website. Some 70% of those are specific to um, our rare disease database. It's largely individuals uh, doing an inquiry in terms of, you know, what is a specific disease. Uh, in many cases, someone may have just been diagnosed or had a family member or friend just diagnosed um, with a condition. Um, in many cases, it's a condition that they probably have never even heard of before. So we have a database of, of the rare conditions, some 10,000 in total. Um, where individuals can learn about um, those diseases. We also have rare disease reports as a part of this database, where we work with companies to um, develop um, specific reports, so a more detailed breakdown of what the disease is, um, the treatment options that are available, um, the research ongoing for a specific disease, um, We'll also link it to a clinical trial database for a specific disease, as well as any products that are approved as well. So this is really the the entry point for many uh, into the uh, the Nord website through this uh, rare disease database. For those conditions where we do not have a report, and we're always looking to do more reports and partner with our industry partners to help underwrite uh, the development of such reports. Um, a company that does underwrite a report, um, they do not have any say in the development of the report. We will do that in-house with our medical writing team. Uh, but we do rely on upon the company to steer us in the direction of key opinion leaders um, and others who may have uh, um, knowledge and that can contribute to the development of such a report. Here is a link uh, or a snapshot of our clinical trial database. Um, individuals can also come to our site specifically to see if a particular disease has a, any clinical trials up and running. What we will do is we will um, provide, in essence, we're copying clinicaltrials.gov. That way we know the site has been vetted. So for a rare disease, we will list all of the clinical trials for that rare disease that are currently ongoing. So we work with our industry partners to uh, ensure that that list is, is current and up to date uh, in terms of uh, listing those clinical trials. Uh, in many cases, it is trials that are ongoing where recruitment is ongoing. Uh, so it's one more avenue for those that are um, doing research on a disease, uh, wanting to find out what trials are ongoing or may have just been diagnosed with the disease, um, by having this link to the rare disease database, they might be able to enroll in an ongoing trial as well. Um, we also serve um, as a repository of information for our membership. So let's say hypothetically someone's diagnosed with a condition, they don't know where to turn. Um, they don't know who to contact. We have a repository of all of our membership um, as well as contact information associated with our members. Again, approximately 360 members. Um, but then on top of that, we have thousands of other organizations that are not members that we will list on this database as well. Hopefully serving as an avenue to connect a, uh, an individual, in many cases, a newly diagnosed individual with an organization that is specifically focused on that particular condition that an individual might be diagnosed with. This is really a central component of what we do at NORD. Um, on top of that, we have the patient registry, I am rare, um, specifically for small patient populations, those that are hard to diagnose or have delayed diagnosis working with a patient advocacy organization to develop um, such a patient registry to understand a natural history of the disease and its progression. Um, in many cases, there's a poor understanding of how that disease has progressed. Um, so we will work with the patient organization to develop um, such a registry. 
Um, <clears throat> uh, so as you can just see here, some of the uh, the key points, and you'll see the uh, direct link on our website uh, to this program. Um, <clears throat> uh, our our corporate partners, our industry partners, um, they cannot sponsor a patient registry, nor do they have data to the information that is developed. Um, that will belong to the patient advocacy organization. However, um, our industry partners can work with the patient advocacy organization directly to help underwrite the development of the patient registry if they so choose. But the information that's developed from the patient registry belongs to the patient advocacy organization uh, specifically. Uh, then lastly, our, our NORD Centers of Excellence. Um, this was just launched in 2021, 40 centers throughout the U.S., uh, two in the state of Pennsylvania, um, CHOP, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Penn Medicine, uh, located in Philadelphia, uh, and then the Center for Rare Disease Therapy at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Um, so these 40 centers comprise the first national network of U.S. medical institutions dedicated to uh, not only treating, but diagnosing and researching all rare diseases. So an individual who goes to a uh, just a community hospital or to their local physician and is even diagnosed uh, to an expert in the field, in many cases, they will not have much of a working knowledge in rare diseases, let alone that specific rare disease. Um, and even if they're diagnosed, in many cases, they will be referred to um, uh, a well-known expert. Well, this uh, network of experts will serve as that body to uh, accept these referrals and to focus specifically on rare disease diagnosis, research, and treatment. <clears throat> uh, like I said, um, these are some of the leading institutions throughout the U.S. The, the network is modeled after existing care and research networks uh, for single rare diseases. So I come from a background in hemophilia where uh, there is a federally funded hemophilia treatment center network of some 140 centers throughout the country, including seven within the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and this network is based in part upon that network, but with a larger focus on rare diseases in general, because the number of networks for existing rare diseases are, are very few. Um, so the goal of this network is to shorten the time for diagnosis. Unfortunately, a rare disease diagnosis is typically upwards of 10 years. There have been examples of people living 20, 30, 40 years even that we've seen in survey data just within the, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania without a diagnosis of that rare disease in large part because the medical community is not aware of that rare disease. Um, medical teaching facilities, medical teaching institutions do not spend a lot of time on rare disease, let alone on specific rare diseases. So, um, you know, just from my background, if you're a, uh, uh, um, a specialist in the area of pulmonology, the rare disease of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency if you spend an hour on that and you're three plus years of, of medical training, it's a lot. Um, if you go to a hematologist, they will likely have never have treated someone with hemophilia. They'll focus more on blood uh, and on the larger issues surrounding blood infections, sepsis, et cetera. Um, so the goal is to shorten that time of diagnosis. It's also to improve the quality and access to care. The more we can ra raise awareness of this network, the more referrals that will happen to this network, the improvement in quality and access to care uh, for individuals that are a part of this network. Um, as I said, accelerating research and development of new treatments, um, we will, in this network, will um, do some of that early initial research in terms of rare disease product development, hopefully partner with a company or companies that are interested in such research as well. Um, our goal is to increase the number of multi-site clinical trials uh, that are taking place. 
um, with rare disease clinical trials, getting those trials up and running is difficult. Identifying institutions to conduct such trials is difficult. We would hope that this center of excellence will serve as uh, a resource to companies that are pursuing clinical trials for a rare disease uh, therapy. Uh, and then lastly, and perhaps most notably, uh, the Rare Disease Center of, of Excellence Network will train more rare disease specialists. And hopefully they can become um, apostles of sorts to spread the word uh, and to teach others in the medical fields about, about rare disease. So um, this is something we're very proud of, this network. Um, we're looking to, to build upon this network and to build uh, uh, support, not only educationally, but financially um, for this network as well. Um, so with that, I think I'll stop there. I did wanna leave some time for um, questions. I, I welcome questions from those uh, um, online and um, happy to address anything I can with regard to NORD or rare disease in general. So thank you so much for your time and your interest in the topic. I appreciate it. So, so Patrick, I, I have a question. It has to do with the uh, Nord Center Centers of Excellence. So I know a lot of rare diseases. Well, some rare diseases will have center of excellences where where you know people get treated. So how does Nord integrate into those other centers of excellences for you know certain rare diseases? In certain cases, if there is a a standing rare disease or a standing center of excellence for that particular rare disease. We may serve as a referral to that network, uh, but in many cases we are interacting with those respective networks that are in place. So whether it's hemophilia, I know there's a sickle cell network um, as well. Um, we will interact with those institutions. And in many cases, um, those uh, specific uh, networks, they'll have facilities in the same institution where we'll have our rare disease center of excellence. Mm -hmm. So okay. both in, in both CHOP and uh, UPMC, um, for example, both have uh, hemophilia treatment uh, centers um, that are a part of the larger network. I believe both have uh, sickle cell networks as well, if I'm correct. Um, but um, we look to build upon what has already been established for those specific conditions. Um, and look, that's where the experts are. In many cases, we will consult and refer directly to those networks and interact directly with those networks at our sites. Um, my question is, I know you mentioned that the bulk of the people that sort of come to the website are looking at that, um, I don't remember the index or the glossary of the different types of diseases. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about, do you see a people who come to the website because their doctors have referred them to you? Do physicians tend to send folks over to the Nord website as they come across patients with these issues? Does that happen pretty frequently? Uh, it, it does happen. I, I, I can't say that it's frequent or at least the, it's the majority of referrals. And in many cases, it's individuals um, like I said, it's some 70% of our 2 million hits a month going wow. to the rare disease database specifically. The The majority of the cases or the plurality of the cases, probably a better way to say it, is specifically um, either someone who's just been diagnosed or has a family member um, who has been diagnosed or they've just heard about a disease, whether it's through a friend or um, a colleague that has shared that they have this condition really just as a way to learn about that condition. We do serve as a um, uh, a site that people ref refer to us, uh, physicians in certain cases where, um, uh, in many cases, to learn more about the condition where, you know, I think you may have X. Um, you know, I don't know um, where to refer you to, but there is the National Organization of rare disorders, that might be an avenue for you to to learn more. Um, so we are kind of the the catch all uh, in that initial uh, diagnosis or that initial um, uh, opinion that it could be X disease, whatever that might be.
Sure. Thank you so much. And then our hope is once they come into the site um, that uh, they will uh, uh, be repeat um, customers, so to speak, and um, learn more about Nord and um, learn more about our members. And hopefully, um, you know, we can refer them to our members and those individuals can um, acquire what they need, whether it's information, whether it's um, patient services of some type, whatever it might be. Wonderful. It's really providing so much value to these patients and their families. Thank you. Hi, Patrick. I have another question. Yes, Jay. Uh, uh, sorry, my video is not on. I'm having some issues with it, so apologies for that. Uh, great presentation. Uh, my question for you is, uh, you know, there are some uh, some rare disease where there are not advocacy groups. Mm -hmm. And I realize that there are a certain number of 300-odd advocacy groups who are affiliated with NORD. So what happens to those, two, two questions. First of all, what happens to those advocacy groups which are not related to NORD? Do you play any role with that? That's one thing. And second thing for, for you know, a small number of diseases where there's just no advocacy groups because the diseases are such a very rare and when you might not have advocacy groups for all, all of those, uh, uh, you know, rare diseases, what role does NORD play in that, so? Well, thank you uh, for the question, Jay. Uh, uh, in terms of the organizations that are not are not members of NORD, clearly we'll still um, work with them and, and partner with them where where we can and where appropriate. At the end of the day, our goal is to ensure that those who have a rare disease can obtain um, access to therapy to treat that condition, to promote research and development of rare disease therapies. Um, so, um, you know, as I indicated earlier, while our membership is some 360 members, uh, on our database of organizations, um, we list those that are not members as well. Um, we want to ensure that individuals have access to, um, the organization in that particular, uh, condition. Um, numerous reasons why organizations might not be members. They may have been in the past and just decided, not to renew, uh, they may just determine that um, it's not worth the uh, the nominal amount. Many are startup organizations, so um, it might be lower on their list of activities or or items to to join Nord. In the end, it doesn't really uh, matter. We 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 provide um, the links to access to those organizations because it's the right thing to do. Um, period. For those conditions where there is not a, a an organization in place, um, <clears throat> NORD actually works with many individuals who contact us wanting to start up uh, a, a patient advocacy organization for a particular condition. So our education team um, uh, and our community services team, um, we have capacity building um, as a core service where we can work with individuals who are interested in starting up an organization uh, and encourage them to do that and provide some of the background and services and those capacity building um, services that are necessary to do that. Moreover, we will uh, provide educational services for them in terms of how to fundraise. Um, we are initiating an effort now in terms of of building uh, health insurance and uh, coverage literacy uh, for organizations as well, where they can become better advocates for their constituents in terms of helping their constituents navigate um, the uh, insurance uh, hurdles that will undoubtedly be in place for our disease. So we do try to work with individuals who um, did not see any organizations for their respective condition and are looking to start up um, such an organization as well. So hope that helps, Jay. Patrick, how are you guys funded? It sounds like there's definitely some donation. Obviously, there's people have to join, so you have to pay. I'm just kind of curious how that whole process works. Because you have a pretty extensive network, and I know that some items are free, but, you know, everything costs money to run. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, uh, the pharma industry is our, our majority contributor. Uh, so we have what's called a corporate council uh, of uh, industry partners, and there is a dues-paying structure there uh, based upon the level of development of the organization. So we have preclinical membership, clinical membership, and then approved product membership. Uh, and we have some... 110 approximately uh, corporate partners who are members. Um, also, we have a business uh, membership as well to that corporate council where if you're not a manufacturer or potential manufacturer of therapies, you can join as a business partner. So associations, uh, clinical research organizations have the opportunity to join as well. Uh, sponsorship. Uh, so our, uh, our summit is our single biggest event that we do each year. Uh, so significant sponsorship, the lion's share of that is is from industry. A lot of our other uh, initiatives are industry funded. Uh, so uh, the pharmaceutical industry does provide the majority of NORD funding. Uh, we also have uh, individual uh, um, fundraising and development as well. Uh, so, um, you know, looking at some of the... Uh, um, the, the key uh, funds that are out there, uh, the key uh, networks that are out there, charitable organizations that are out there for uh, uh, for such uh, donations. So we will solicit those as well. Uh, our actual funding to be a member of NORD as a patient advocacy organization is nominal. It's based on income that they have, but it doesn't exceed $1,000 in many cases. For the organizations that are members, it, it's literally a couple of hundred dollars a year, if not, if not less than that, uh, quite frankly. Uh, so <clears throat> we are trying to diversify our, our network of funding. We do receive some government grants as well um, uh, to move forward, but um, trying to diversify that where we can. I think every 501c3 organization um, would love to increase the um the support from the non-industry side, um, Nord being a part of that as well. But, um, you know, we recognize that our industry partners play a major role in what we do, and um, uh, we want to work with them where we can. Beacon is the premier executive networking organization serving the Mid-Atlantic region. To learn more, go to beaconforlife.org.